the Constitution is very wary of, of populism as a means of government. Um, it is also simultaneously very wary of a kind of technocratic approach to the means of government. It doesn't trust the experts and it doesn't trust the people. It doesn't trust anybody. That's the beauty of the Constitution. It doesn't assume that someone has the answer. It's built on the premise that no one has the answer and given that, how are we going to be free? Let's uh, talk about reform, conservatism, mm -hmm. uh, then and now, as it were. Um, if you're in a situation, reform is a great idea if you're in a situation that can be reformed right. or that's susceptible of reform. So I assume y you, you would not think that conservatives have to rule out the possibility of revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think reform is, is useful in a society that has functional institutions that have decayed or have been deformed. Um, and reform is a kind of regaining of the right form or, 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 uh, or gaining of the right form. Um, there are certainly instances when societies are in a shape where that can't happen, or more likely when institutions are in a shape when that can't happen. And so I, I think what conservatism means now, and even what people are calling reform conservatism now, uh, has in it a lot of revolution. Uh, it certainly involves an undoing of the logic of the welfare state and therefore a lot of the institutions of the welfare state. Uh, you know, it, 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 it sounds like Paul Ryan, which sounds to a lot of people like uh, revolutionary talk. Um, and there's a reason for that. Those institutions embody a progressive and liberal vision of how government ought to approach its society that is very, very far from the conservative view and I think from the American view. And to get to the right place, uh, which is to say to reform our institutions so that they are functioning properly, requires a lot of change. Um, I think that change does take the shape of reform, which is to say it starts from where we are. It doesn't start from scratch. But the end it has in mind is a very, very different place. And um, you know, th there's a limit to what pure gradualism can achieve. Gradualism uh, it, it means that you take care not to overly disrupt the lives of, uh, of, of the public. But it doesn't mean that you accept premises and principles that aren't true and build on them. Uh, it, it means you have to change. And if you'll indulge me for just a minute, uh, before pursuing that very interesting thread, uh, was Burke right about the French Revolution? That is, was he right in thinking that that was a regime that could have been reformed, should have been reformed? Um, rather than overturned. Well, of course, it's, it's impossible to say. History went a certain way. Um, I think he was right about the French Revolution in the sense that where he saw it going is where it did go. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that was uh, a, a great part of why the British turned to Burke after a few years of the French Revolution, because he predicted more or less exactly what happened. Uh, and he thought it would happen that way because the French were taking much too radical a step, or overthrowing their entire history, trying to start over in ways that no real human society could stand, and in fact, French society couldn't stand it. Burke was not a defender of the old regime, um, and certainly acknowledged that a lot of what it was doing was unacceptable. What he argued to the revolutionaries was, were, was that there were threads and strands in their own history that they could draw on, that the French had a glorious history, and that by reaching further back than simply the previous generation, they might be able to uh, build a new order that is a genuinely French order, rather than one that was some kind of purely rational, th literally throw out the calendar and start from year one. Mm -hmm. Um, that struck him as just impossible in principle and impossible in practice. Um, I think he was right about that, but you know, th there probably was not a truly gradualist response mm -hmm. to what it, w to what was happening uh, in, in in 1789 in France. But there was a more conservative response in the sense of one that took its own heritage to be a blessing and not a curse. I've uh, often been struck by the difference between Tocqueville's view of the old regime mm -hmm. and uh, Burke's because, you know, when Tocqueville wrote his book um, on the old regime and the revolution, his view seemed to be that the thing was really rotten to the core. Yeah. I mean, it had already centralized and had turned into a kind of administrative state avant la lettre, yeah. which um, um, was uh, was too too far gone in, in, diff in, in different sins, you yeah. know to be composed um, again. And if that were true, as uh, what Tocqueville asserts, 
then your expectations for, for the revolution might have been tragic and yeah. nothing but tragic, but it also might have led to, uh, to uh, uh, different policy mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of the thing. Um, yeah. You think Tocqueville was more right or Burke more right? Well, I think Tocqueville was probably more right. He certainly was better positioned to know the facts, and he's quite critical of Burke's descriptions of France, and some of Burke's descriptions of France plainly are factually wrong. They were the facts that were available at the time, what, what, what informed Englishmen thought, but they weren't true. Um, so, you know, that, that matters at the end of the day. Um, but I, I do think that Burke's argument to the revolutionaries that their revolution could have been much more French and much less abstract and universal probably would have appealed to Tocqueville and in some yeah. respects did appeal to Tocqueville. That is that the, the, there is a history to draw on. Tocqueville in the, in the author's introduction to Democracy in America, his other wonderful book, um, gives you a kind of history of liberalism that's a very interesting thing because it doesn't even mention the Enlightenment. Um, it basically says if you look in on France every 20 years starting in the 13th century, you'll find it more democratic every time. Right. Um, that suggests that there's a lot to draw on in French history for making a truly democratic regime and that the sharp break that happened, uh, the catastrophic break, was not essential that the revolution was happening in a gradual way, or at least that democratization was happening in a gradual way. I think that's a very Burkean description. That, that very much is Burke's view of English history as well, which is that you should understand the liberal society as the fruition of this very long process, not as an invention of, uh, of clever Enlightenment philosophers. Mm. Does, the, does the, the Burkean approach, though, leave you a little weak on the justice question? Yeah, because, I think it... I mean, in, precisely in many cir circumstances, in order to guide moderate reform, you, you do need some kind yeah. of principle or you need some kind of image of what justice yeah. or something more just at least would be, don't you? I think the justice question is without doubt the most challenging question for Burke. And it is, of course, the essential political question. So that's no small problem. Um, the justice question is where Paine always thought he had the edge on Burke. Paine's principles are right there on the surface. He can point to them, and they clearly are principles of justice, and, and really quite admirable principles of justice. Burke always argued, again, that you can't know principles like that directly. You have to know them through what is best about your own society. And so the principles he ends up with are not so different from Paine's, but the idea that you could base a regime on those principles as abstract philosophical principles struck him as impossible. Uh, that means that Burkeanism is better suited to a functional society and to one that has a history uh, that is at some level a history of liberty. Um, I think that means it is suitable to America, but I also think it's not suitable to everywhere. Um, it is a, an Anglo-American idea of how conservatism can help make liberalism sustainable. Um, and you know, ultimately I think that is a big part of the role that conservatism plays in a liberal society. Um, it means we're lucky. We have a society where liberalism can be sustainable if we, do the, if, if we approach it properly. Um, I don't know that the, whole, that the whole world is that lucky. What about the Middle Eastern corners of it? Well, they certainly don't seem to be lucky <laughs> at all. Um, look, I think Burke would have found that the notion that yeah. you could install democracy in the Middle East very implausible. Um, and uh, he thought that about India before the British were even trying to right. install democracy really in India. Um, Burke argued that every society has to build on what is best about its own traditions and I, I think there certainly are things that are admirable about the traditions of the Muslim world so that there are things to build on. They're somewhat distant uh, in that history and so building on them would take some effort. I'd like to think that that's imaginable but I don't think it can be done by importing John Locke mm -hmm. uh, to the Arab world. I, that, that doesn't strike me as a plausible strategy. I, I also don't think it's fair to say that that was the strategy. Right. Um, but to the extent that it was, it certainly doesn't make much sense to me. Now, um, to come back to American domestic reform, uh, the most successful conservative reformer in the last generation was Ronald Reagan. I don't think anyone would, would yeah. deny that. And so he commences his reform by quoting Tom Paine, um, saying that we have it in our power to begin the world over again. Yeah. And this is, uh, as <laughs> George Will and others have said, thing yeah, the least ever said. conservative thing you could say. But, yes. but he, uh, why did he say it? Yeah, I, you what know, did he mean by if it? If you look at, what, at when Reagan used that line, and he used it a fair amount, um, it is in calling Americans to do great things. It's in trying to kind of wake the country out of 
a, uh, a malaise, which mm -hmm. he saw it as his role to wake the country out of. It was always in the sense of we can do big things in America. It was not, Ronald Reagan was not saying, I, I think, that we should uh, end religion and overthrow <laughs> our existing government altogether and start over from scratch on principles of absolute democracy. Um, that does not seem to have been his view. But uh, he, he found the energy of pain very appealing. And, and the energy of pain is very appealing. Um, he, he meant to say, I think, if you take him in context, and certainly in the context in which uh, it, that statement was made to the largest audience, which is in the 1980 convention mm -hmm. in accepting the nomination, Reagan was really saying that we shouldn't think that our story is over, that mm -hmm. we can only do small things now. We can be Americans uh, and look at what Americans did in the past and see ourselves in their mm -hmm. shoes. I think there's a lot of truth to that, but uh, it's not quite what Tom Paine meant when he used those words. No. I wonder, too, um, as I've reflected more on Reagan, whether he also meant at some level that just the difficulty of getting the state under control again, I mean, the, mm -hmm. of, of accomplishing some of the th kinds of things which national affairs talks about so well in every issue, um, is going to be such a colossally difficult job yeah. uh, that it's almost as though you were making a revolution. It's almost as though you were really pulling a Tom Paine um, in the context of our far gone uh, and dissolute political order. Yeah. And, and, and you would be, I take it, uh, sympathetic to that, to the notion that yeah. it, it is well, going yes. to take I, something big to... Oh, absolutely. But I, I think that it's a conservative revolution in the sense that it appeals to not only principles but practice that are to be found in our own political heritage. Um, so I think that it is a return in many important respects, but that it will require a tremendous undertaking, there's no question. I think that's certainly true. The, the, the liberal welfare state is very deeply ingrained now in how we live. And uh, to, to uproot it and to put in its place what I would think of as the right kind of government um, is not going to be a matter of tinkering. There's no way around that. And the, uh, and the solution is maybe too pat a term, but the way yeah. forward uh, is not, in your estimate, the libertarian way, yeah. or it's not um, dismantling the modern state. Well, yes, I mean, I think that's so for practical reasons, at least. Mm -hmm. um, dismantling the modern state is just not going to be appealing to the American public, and we do not want to make the public defensive of the liberal welfare state, which I think is a risk you run when you offer too little in place of uh, what people have gotten mm -hmm. accustomed to, whether it's good or bad. Um, and so I, and I also think that there is a role for government in helping people live flourishing lives. Now, that role is not a leading role. It's a supporting role. And the role amounts largely to building and sustaining a space in which our society can thrive, which is not what the welfare state does. The welfare state tries to fill that space. So I think that it's a very, very different role than what government does now. But I do think that uh, some libertarians, I mean, I think there are a lot of libertarians who are certainly on the same page on that front, and who function in, in very practical ways to just try to persuade people to move in the right direction. But there is also certainly a libertarianism that is both uh, conceptually too radical, is too philosophically individualistic, mm -hmm. um, doesn't ultimately see society in the way that I incline to see it, uh, and that is also maybe too radical in its tactical judgments. Um, but conservatives and libertarians are working together. I mean, I think we're trying to defend idea, an, an idea of liberty and an idea of American life that are very similar. I, I don't think it's a purely tactical alliance. I think there's mm -hmm. uh, a lot in common. And the other phenomenon which uh, sometimes abuts uh, libertarianism is populism. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a kind, I mean, the Tea Party was in many ways a very uh, encouraging and positive uh, development. Um, it is, it, it's, populism was unusual in being also a kind of constitutionalism. The yeah. two things which mostly seem to be in tension were yeah. very much, at least in the beginning, in harmony. How do you um, yeah. look back now uh, at the Tea Party as, an, as a reform proposal, as, as mm -hmm. an instrument of reform? Well, I, I think the Tea Party is the best thing to happen in American life since the end of the Reagan years, um, because it was a kind of awakening to the problems that we need to be awakened to. Uh, now, of course, awakening is not enough. Uh, to address those problems, you also have to take them on. Um, but I do think that 
I think populism is, is right and appropriate in thinking about the ends of government. Government should serve the public. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and that's, there, there's certainly room for that in our constitutional order. The Constitution is very wary of, of populism as a means of government. Um, it is also simultaneously very wary of a kind of technocratic approach to the means of government. It doesn't trust the experts and it doesn't trust the people. It doesn't trust anybody. That's the beauty of the Constitution. It doesn't assume that someone has the answer. It's built on the premise that no one has the answer and given that, how are we going to be free? I think that premise is right, um, and that conservatism is built on that too. That's what low expectations mean in human <laughs> affairs. We just assume we're not going to get this right, and so how do we, we minimize have high the damage of low expectations? Yeah, you it? know, th this is a this is a bunch of human beings. How do we keep them from causing trouble? And so, w w in a funny way, American progressives try to reverse both of those. They try to trust both the people and the experts at the right. same time. Um, and so obviously they're opposed to the American constitutional order as a result of that. And they believe that, uh, or certainly they used to believe, it's not clear really what they believe now, I have to say, but uh, progressivism originally involved a faith in the public to choose to be led by experts. Mm -hmm. um, so that more populist uh, democratic means, more direct elections, more referenda, would lead to a government that was more technocratic. I don't know why we would have thought that, but they did think that. And that put them in direct tension with the American Constitution. I think the Tea Party is an effort to revive our understanding of constitutionalism, but it began with revival. I think it needs to, to, to progress toward actual public policy that tries to put in place a way of thinking about government uh, that sees its role as building and sustaining that space. And that's what, that's what conservatives are starting to do now, I think.